Morning. We are gathered at UCLA on the 12th of December, 11th of December, to resolve that the U.S. should unilaterally reduce carbon emission, regardless of whether China, India, and other developing countries cooperate. Are you DK? Oh. On the government will be Ian and the opposition Janice. There in the middle. Thank you. The chair will recognize the leader of the government, Sir Ian. <laughs> He's a knight. For a speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Can I tell you to assist me in time? Thank you. We'll do this together. Oh, you got the big one, huh? <laughs> And the time has started. Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for listening to me debate yet again. Uh, the resolution that we will be discussing today is the United States should unilaterally reduce carbon emissions, regardless of whether China, India, and developing countries cooperate. Uh, this will be presented as a policy case. Uh, definitions are relatively self-explanatory. Unilaterally is one I will define, which means individually, without regard for actions of others meaning that the United States will do this regardless of whether anyone does it or not, or anyone else adopts policies similar to this or not. Uh, the criteria for this debate will be net benefits to the United States of America. Primary focus will be the populace's well-being, environmental, and economic concerns. Um, so to launch right into this, uh, here are my harms. Uh, first off, the United States is a large emitter of carbon. We all know this. Currently, the United States is actually the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide on the planet, second only to China, and not by that much. The Department of Energy's last data compilation uh, made in 2010, shows that the United States produces approximately 5,619 million metric tons of carbon per year. Uh, just for fun, I came up with some numbers, and actually this is approximately, uh, to put this number in perspective, this is the weight of 4,765,903,737 Volkswagen buses, or the approximate weight of 1,188,200,000 African, uh, African elephants. So that's a lot of carbon that we produce every single year. Uh, according to the Energy Information Administration, carbon emissions from transportation counts for 22 to 28 percent of the United States' carbon emissions in 2010. This comes out to 100, uh, or sorry, 1,236 million metric tons of carbon. Uh, according to the Department of Transportation, 128, uh, sorry, yeah, 128 million people commute to work on a daily basis. 75 percent of these people uh, commute alone, with only 12.19 carpool, 12.19 uh, percent carpooling. The remaining 12.11% uses various forms of public tra uh, transportation, such as buses and subways. So, the United States government proposes that we subsidize companies that shift their infrastructures so that employees now work from home. Uh, the agent of action and agent enforcement for this will both be department, uh, or the Treasury Department. It makes sense because it's a tax subsidy. Um, so, solvency. The reason that this solves for the harm. The policy enacted as outlined would incentivize companies to enact work-at-home policies, thus significantly reducing carbon-emitting traffic and thereby reducing nationwide carbon emissions. The government freely admits that not all traffic is a result of commuters, so this won't solve for all carbon emissions in the United States. However, if 50% of traffic were reduced, carbon emissions would be cut by 618,090,000 metric tons. Now, if traffic were reduced by 20%, 
carbon emissions would be cut by 247,213,000 metric tons. That's approximately the weight of every single human being on the planet added up together. Uh, actually, if, it were only, if we only reduced traffic by 1% in the United States, carbon emissions would still be cut by 12,361,000 metric tons. So we're cutting a lot of carbon regardless of how many people we actually uh, stop from commuting. Now the advantage is to this, in addition to what we just talked about for carbon, uh, carbon reduction, government subsidization allows for policy implementation to be adopted by companies that are structurally able to do so, without mandating that stay-at-home policies be adopted by companies in which this policy is unfeasible or a burden. That means that basically if a company can't handle this easily, if it's going to hurt the company, they just don't have to do it. It's not like they're going to get a new tax on them, it's just a subsidization. It just helps companies that do do this. So, companies such as mass call centers, data analysis hubs, computer engineering offices, or any others propose, uh, possessing desk jobs are all easily changed over to this model. With modern innovations such as high-speed home internet, powerful home computers, services such as Skype and virtual office software, the change is actually really cheap and convenient. Uh, for companies in which this is not feasible, such as warehouses, retail businesses, construction companies, and so on, no burden is placed, no fines are incurred, and the status quo remains the same. So there's no downside to this policy, there's only upside. This pol uh, advantage B is this, mo this policy is moderately self-funded due to costs saved on road maintenance. Now, most people might not think that road ma maintenance actually amounts to that much, but guess what? According to the annual highway report, spending on state-owned roads totaled $132 billion in 2012. I had no idea road maintenance cost that much. California in particular is, uh, has one of, the is one, of the is one of the worst offenders, due largely to heavy use, of congestion, uh, heavy use and congestion in cities such as Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Francisco. And we typically spend $500,000 per state-owned mile. That's ridiculous. So, while subsidization will not be free, costs will be relatively mitigated by saving in-road maintenance. A lot of that traffic congestion in those high-cost areas is due to commuting. Uh, all co costs not covered by the savings are considered <coughs> worthwhile due to the benefit of reduced carbon emissions. So what I'm basically saying is that it will cost us some money, subsidies cost money, but we're reducing a lot of carbon emissions and we're doing it relatively cheaply. So, all in all, good things. Next advantage is that lives are saved. According to the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, 2.24 million people were injured in motor vehicle accident crashes in 2010, and 32,885 lives were lost in vehicular accidents in the same year. Now, quantifiable data is not available for projected, uh, projected values on how many lives we can save or how many accidents we can stop. Um, but simple logic dictates that the fewer cars that are on the road, the less accidents and injuries and deaths it will have, right? So the impact is the government, possess, uh, the government proposes that any reduction in automate, uh, automotive fatalities, even a single life saved, is still a good thing. It might, be a, it might not be a giant impact for this plan, but we are creating an impact in life saved. We consider that to be a pretty large value. Uh, advantage D is that companies are further incentivized to opt into the stay-at-home model due to the money saved by not maintaining physical locations. Rented office space, buildings full of cubicles, and even skyscrapers all cost incredible amounts of money to rent and maintain. In San Francisco, the average cost for renting office space is $36 per square foot. That's, uh, that's $54,000 per month for a 15,000 uh, square foot office space, which is the average size of most call centers. Uh, my disadvantage is that reduction in uh, physical locations leads to even more reduction in carbon emissions. While transportation accounts score between 22 to 28 percent of the United States carbon emissions, thank you, energy, production costs account, uh, energy production accounts for 32 percent. In 2012, the Energy Information Administration disclosed the U.S. now has 55, or sorry, 5.5 uh, million commercial buildings in the United States, resulting in nearly 90 billion square feet of commercial space. These spaces are industrial lit with overhead lighting, uh, most maintain router networks, printer networks, and various other electrical devices that siphon off energy. Imagine how much electricity is used to power just one skyscraper. The Information, uh, the information Administration uh, information, and information Administration states that 40% of the United, United States' energy consumed is due to commercial buildings. Um, with the plan proposed, not only are carbon emissions reduced by fewer individuals driving to work, but now the office space and the resulting energy consumed is also no longer necessary, creating, creating even more greater environmental gains. So for all these reasons, we see that you know, the plan really has no downside, tons of upsides. Please vote for the government. Thank you very much. Thank you. I now send over cross-examination. Okay, will you come to the center of the room for three minutes of cross-examination, please? Thank you, Ian. Um, so, uh, was it correct that you said um, U.S. is the second largest emitter of carbon dioxide? Yes. So, um, translating that to the global scale, how many percent of the global um, carbon dioxide emission does U.S. Um, oh. emit every year? 
Uh, I don't have it on my brief. I think it was close to like 15 to 18 percent. Yes, it is 15 in uh, 2012. What about the percentage of China? Uh, China is around, I think, 18 to 21 percent. According to uh, the data of European Commission in 2012, it's 29 percent. Oh, so, okay. do you agree that China is emitting a double of um, what the U.S. is emitting? Approximately, yes. Yes. So, um, do you know what is the trend of the carbon dioxide emission in China? Is it growing or declining? Uh, steel industry is booming, actually, so I think it's increasing. Yes, it's increasing um, at an average of 10%, actually. But last year, it was um, the lowest in 10 years. It, it was 3%. And what about the emission of um, the U.S.? What is the trend of it? Uh, we're increasing due to... Uh, it has something to do with our, our ecological... Or the, Basically, our farming practices are making us produce more carbon, but most of it is not going to the atmosphere, it's going to the oceans now. So we're producing a different way. According to the report, it was actually decreasing by 4% steadily every year. Okay. That might be true of atmospheric carbon pollution, yes. yes. Um, do you agree that the main goal to reduce carbon emission is to protect our environment? Very much so. Yes. And um, do you think that it is effective for U.S. to reduce carbon emission? Absolutely. So um, compare these two scenarios. First, is that U.S. is reducing carbon emission alone, and the second um, scenario is that it's reducing carbon emission with China or India or other um, developing countries. Which one is more effective? Oh, absolutely. If Focus on your judges. They're the, the, the ones, ones you're trying to persuade. Though, is that we're doing it regardless of whether they do it or not. We're not doing it. Uh, it's not saying that America is only enacting these policies alone and we will not accept help from anyone else. It's that whether or not they do it, America should still do it. Sure. Um, <coughs> So why are we reducing, I'm sorry, uh, what is the advantage of doing it laterally instead of doing it together with other countries? Uh, there isn't one. Unilaterally just means that we're, again, doing it regardless of whether they do or not. So it's not saying that they can't also, not do, they can't do this also. It just means that whether they choose to do it or not, we will. So we're going to make a difference and then they can do their own, you know, they can either join us or not. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Carol now recognizes the leader of the opposition for her constructive speech not to exceed seven minutes in length. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, good afternoon, everyone. And once again, I oppose to the idea that U.S. should unilaterally reduce carbon emissions, regardless of whether China, India, or other developing countries cooperate. To clarify my position as the negative side, it essentially means that today I'm arguing towards that U.S. should only reduce carbon emissions if other developing countries cooperate. Throughout the, deba the debate, I would like all of us to agree that the main goal of reducing carbon emission is to protect our global environment, and that the more carbon dioxide we are reducing, the better it is for our planet. So first, let me introduce some data on carbon emission to you all. According to the report on um, trends in carbon emissions published by European Emission in 2013, the first largest emitter is China. They're emitting 29% of the global carbon dioxide. And the U.S. is the second largest, emitting 15%. So the, the carbon emissions are actually soaring in, car in China and India and in other developing countries. Since 2002, carbon emission increased by 150% in China, and in India, 75%. However, in the U.S., the emissions decreased by 4% from 2011 to 2012, accounting for a minus 40% of the net global carbon dioxide increase in 2012. From these data, we can see that China emits twice as much as carbon dioxide than the U.S., and it is in a growing trend. Thus, this leads to my first point, that the U.S. only accounts for a small percentage of the global carbon dioxide emission, and thus, by reducing carbon emission without the cooperation with other developing countries, especially China, U.S. will achieve a low effectiveness in protecting our environment. How so? According to Wall Street Journal published two weeks ago, no feasible reduction in the U.S. can mean a meaningful impact on the global greenhouse gas levels without the participation of China and India, where rapid economic growth has dramatically increased emissions. Putting it into numbers, the dean in Texas A&M University School of Law, Mr. Morris, said last month that even cutting the carbon emission in the U.S. level by 25% would only reduce the world emission by a total of less than 4% in which the growth in emission in China at current rates would replace those reductions in less than two years. 
With the low effectiveness of reducing carbon emission alone, the U.S. would also bear a very high cost of doing it unilaterally, which leads to my second point, that the cost is far outweighing its benefits and the U.S. cannot afford such costs right now. According to the Wall Street Journal, again, the U.S. emission has have decreased in recent years due, due to recession and increasing use of natural gas. But we haven't done any of the hard parts of reducing emissions. Steps that will eliminate jobs and will hurt growth. Carbon fuels so are, are the sources of more than 80% of the energy and virtually everything we consume has energy embedded in it. Expensive modifications will be required. Also, shifting to renewables or dramatically increasing mandates for efficiency will make everything cost more. Just shifting our tra transportation fleet to na natural gas from gasoline and diesel would require a major expansion of our natural gas pipeline network and rapid expansion of contro controversial fracking operations. So, Therefore, the U.S. cannot afford such costs right now, and over time, these technological progress will cut the price of reducing carbon um, emissions, um, which lead to another reason why we should sign a global agreement. Moving on how big is the problem. First, climate change and global warming are urgent issues threatening our lives, our generation. Take a look at some authorities that have warned us about it. The U.S. National Climate Assessment said in 2013 that climate change, once considered an issue for a distant future, has moved firmly to the present. On top of that, there are observed, there are observed and projected consequences of climate change. The observed consequences include melting ice, sea level rise, more intense storms, declining crop yield, ocean acidifications, and loss in biodiversity. The reason for having a climate change problem is due to human expansion of greenhouse effect, mainly carbon dioxide. It is obvious that a solution must be brought about to protect our environment in our planet. The main solution is that developing nations should work with the U.S. hand in hand to solve the, gro to solve the global problem together. And more effectively, since the <coughs> developing nations are increasing their carbon emission, U.S. should work laterally with these developing nations. Less than a month ago, in, um, on November 11, 2014, President Obama and Chinese President made history by jointly announcing the U.S. and China's respective targets for reducing their greenhouse gas emission, driving climate change in post-2020 period. The world's two largest economies, energy consumers and carbon emitters, are reaching across traditional divides and working together to demonstrate leadership on an issue that affects the entire world. This agreement made marked an impressive milestone. However, this should only mark the beginning of the continuous efforts. Looking at the effectiveness of um, the agreement, According to the United Nations Environmental Program in 2014, humans can only afford to pump 1,000 more gigatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere if you want to keep the world's temperature within 2 degrees Celsius increase. So looking at how much of CO2 emission will China increase in, um, in this agreement. So by 2013, China would be producing 14.55 gigatons a year. And the U.S. will be reducing its um, emission, and by 2025, it's going to emit 4.44 um, gigatons a year. However, putting it into simplifying it for you, um, their goals are a. Um, sorry, this actually the combination of the two countries would blow nearly two thirds of the 1,000 gigaton budget by mid-century, leaving the rest of the world with, which is 55% of carbon emitters with less than 400 gigatons to spend amongst themselves. Therefore, based on the urgency of the threat of climate changing and global warming, immediate action and strong results in reduction in carbon dioxide emission is needed. Thus, U.S. alone would not be able to bring any substantial results. Nevertheless, all nations should cooperate and work together, especially the developing nations. Um, thus, the U.S. should not unilaterally reduce carbon emission. I now stand for the Thank you so much.
Chair will now entertain a cross-examination for the period not to exceed three minutes in length. Will you stand together for the camera's purposes? Thank you. Okay. Um, Janice, quick question, actually. Do you recycle? Um, yes. Okay. Do your neighbors recycle? I think so. Do, does everyone on your block recycle? Most unlikely. But why do you recycle then if your neighbor's not doing it? Um, actually, uh, it's interesting because I recycle mainly water bottles and we collect it and uh, we bring it to the recycling uh, place and then we get money. That's fantastic. So, you know, but you still do that even though some other people don't, right? Um, it's actually not paying back that much, so I'm considering not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make about this is we don't recycle just because other people do. So the U.S. is not going to, you know, reduce carbon emissions or not reduce carbon emissions just because China's not doing it. You know, if we can make a difference, that's awesome. If China decides to do it too, that's also awesome. But we're going to help out regardless. We're going to recycle. We're going to, you know, reduce carbon emissions. It's still a good idea whether someone else decides to or not. Now, another quick question. Um, okay, you have a, a directly quoting you, or at least roughly quoting you. Um, you said, oh, actually, I just talked about that point. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you also said that the, mo the more the better, right? Uh, you said it earlier about you know the more we can reduce carbon emissions, the better. So why should Americans not try and reduce carbon emissions? Then? Because it's ineffective. Um, because according to the brief. Um, well, let me cut you off actually real quick. You said the more the better, though. So even if we're not doing a lot, the more the better, right? So the more we can reduce, the better. Is that not true? That is true. Okay. Um, now, you said that the U.S. is already reducing emissions. Again, I'd like to rebut that. You know, the more the better, right? So if we're already reducing, we should still reduce more. Um, let's see. So that one is okay. So that's the same thing. Now, you also said that the, uh, the cost of um, renewable sources cost too much. Um, can you point out where I, in my brief I talk about renewable sources? Uh, it was not a rebuttal, so it was my plan. Oh, so your <laughs> argument against reducing carbon emissions is that my plan would cost too much even though I don't use renewable sources. Um, it actually, uh, in my rebuttal, I, I actually talk about your policy uh, that it's going to cost a lot to the companies, but basically... Cost the companies? How yes, so? because you said um, you um, want people to work at home, <coughs> but I believe that a working environment should be um, that every employer should be in the same working space so they could have um, interpersonal skills and all the other things that you work together with. So basically we should have them work together because it makes them better people? They get um, better interpersonal skills? And probably more economically benefic beneficial to the company. That's interesting because Google actually thinks exactly the opposite. They have a lot of individuals who are working at home via Skype and actually they're one of the most productive companies in the nation. However, there are people still working in the office. Yeah, there are some. <laughs> But again, that's what we're trying to reduce, get rid of the carbon emissions. Um, let's see, you're also saying it hurts jobs, just br briefly, it, it doesn't, but okay. Um, let's see, you said that global warming has a lot of bad effects, I only have a couple more seconds, but you know, isn't it good that you know, if global warming has a lot of bad effects, then we should try and do everything that we can to reduce it then? That's yeah. time, answer the question. Yes, definitely, that's why doing it with China would bring it to much more efficient and effective. Right. Thank, Thank you. Much. Chair will now hear from a Four-step rebuttal from the government side. Four steps of refutation, we hope. As we've just heard from the opposition side, anything that we can do to help is a good thing. Anything that we can do to reduce carbon emissions is a good thing. This resolution does not call that we have to solve global warming. It doesn't say that we have to eliminate all emissions in the United States. It doesn't say we have to eliminate all emissions in the world. All it's saying is that we should reduce carbon emissions in the United States, and I believe that I've shown that by showing that you know we are going to reduce emissions, we will help out and freaking you know reduce global warming, we're going to reduce the amount of cars on the roads. We also garner a bunch of other benefits such as reduce cost to companies because now they don't have to pay for physical locations as much. They don't have to pay for all the lighting bills and the networks and all those kinds of things. It's and there really is nothing wrong with the program because everyone kind of wins. The companies save money. We reduce carbon emissions. People get to stay at home, which is just awesome. I love that to work in my PJs. Um, so there's really no downsides to this plan. Now the government side, or the, sorry, the opposition side is primarily saying that it's not good because we're not working with China. Well, the, again, the resolution is saying that we should unilaterally 
doesn't mean that we should do it without them. It means that we should do it regardless of whether they help or not. There's a big difference in those terms. We're not saying that, you know, if we're going to do this plan, China cannot. We are not going to cooperate with them. All we're saying in this plan is, regardless of whether they help us out or not, we're going to do it. We're going to recycle if our neighbors don't. It's, that exact, it's just that simple. So let me briefly recap on all the things we've talked about in this. So the plan is, again, to subsidize companies. And again, a subsidy is not, you know, pay for the entire company. It's not an incredibly cost, or it's not incredibly costly to the government. We subsidize. It means we give them a brief tax break. It's nothing big. We subsidize companies that have a stay-at-home model. The stay-at-home, again, they're not losing employees. They're not losing money. In fact, they save money by not having physical locations. Uh, we talked about the United States as a large emitter of carbon, and that, once again, freaking uh, 22 to 28 percent of our carbon emissions comes from transportation. So, regardless of what percentage, if we can reduce carbon by you know, 1 percent, or 20 percent, or 50 percent, there's no data on how many companies will, will switch over to a stay-at-home model, but I can guarantee it's going to be over 1 percent. I mean, they're going to save money on taxes. Who wouldn't want to do that? Um, so, we talked about they're going to save money in that route. Um, We've talked about that the implementation is very easy and cheap to do. Services like Skype are free. There's a lot of software out there that doesn't have, you know, there's online office software that is very, very cheap, especially for a large corporation. I've seen some online for like 50 bucks. Um, all, you know, obviously a lot of people already have internet at the homes. People have computers at home, so this is not an issue. So we're able to do all these things from home already. So this, the, the infrastructure for doing this, for implementing this plan, is already there. Literally all what companies have to do is say, stop driving to work, stop polluting the environment, and work from home. Um, we talked about the, the policy actually recoups a little bit of the money. So some of the money that we spent or that we are not getting from taxes, we actually get back on road maintenance costs. Again, not a massive amount, but we're not spending a massive amount either. As we said before, lives are saved. We're, saving, we're having less traffic on the roads, and therefore less people are going to be killed. Again, no exact statistics on that one, but it doesn't really matter. It's just logic. There doesn't have to be statistics for this. Less people on the roads means less traffic accidents. Is that simple? Um, lastly, we talked about that, or actually I have a couple more points, um, that companies who opt into the stay-at-home model save money by not maintaining physical locations. As we just discussed this, they don't have to rent office space, they don't have to pay the bills for the lighting and all those kinds of things. They save money. And then reduction in physical location leads to even more carbon reduction, uh, reduces even more carbon emissions because now energy costs are lower because we're not paying for all these electrical bills lighting up an entire skyscraper. So there, it's kind of a win-win on this whole entire situation. The opposition has never actually come up with a specific good point saying why we should not reduce carbon emissions in this route. All they've said is that China should do it, which the government fully agrees. China should also do this. And that is not mutually exclusive with this plan. China should do it. We're going to do it. We're going to help out the environment. And for that reason, please vote for the government. Thank you very much. Thank you. Chair now recognizes a rebuttal from the opposition. Four steps of refutation, we hope, for four minutes in length. Hi, everyone. My opponent argues that currently the U.S. Is a, is a large emitter of carbon, second only to China, but not by much. However, he did not address how much the, re, uh, the reduction translates into a global scale. Um, I disagree with what he said by not by much, because the U.S. released 15% of global carbon in 2012, whereas China released 29%. That's like almost half of it. Therefore, loan effort in the U.S. is not effective enough, and well, we, sh we need to work with China and other developing nations so as to uh, make our planet a better place to live. Also, secondly, my opponent argued that transportation makes up a quarter of the total emission in the U.S. and that the U.S. should shift the infrastructure and so that employees could work at home. I agree that we should reduce carbon dioxide emission, however, I disagree with this policy because this is not an effective way of working to the economy. It's, so it's just like a metaphor of uh, homeschooling versus going to school. Um, if, like, people, uh, if students are um, um, taking a car or whatever and going to school, they might as well just stay at home and do homeschooling. There are a lot of um, side effects towards that, interpersonal skills and a lot of other um, uh, things that we could learn when we're uh, working with other people face to face that we're going to be losing if this policy is passed. Other policies could be achieved um, and the same thing could um, result as, uh, as the European U Union is doing. For cars, manufacturers have to ensure that their car fleet does not emit more than an average of 130 grams of carbon dioxide per kilometer 
And the, US, and the EU also have carbon dioxide labeling for cars to help drivers choose new cars with low fuel consumption. What about switching um, subsidizing companies to, um, to support work at home from subsidizing housing allowance so that people could live closer to the office? And what about shifting um, a five-day workday into a four-day workday and adding two hours each day? So there are a lot of other things we could do to reduce carbon emission from cars, like um, using more efficient uh, vehicles, hybrid vehicles, cleaner diesel vehicles, biofuels, and using public transportation, using non-motorized transport like cycling or walking, land use and tra transport planning, second generation biofuels, blah, 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 etc. So my opponent and my goals are both to reduce carbon um, dioxide emission. However, I feel like working with, um, carbon di uh, c working with China and other developing nations, it's going to make it so much more effective and U.S. should not be doing it alone. Last month, the leaders of the world's two largest economies and the world's two biggest emitters stood together and committed to tackling the threat head on. If other leaders follow suit, if more businesses step up, if we keep our level of, of ambition high, we can build a safer, cleaner, and healthier, and more prosperous world future generation does, deserves. Please vote for a negative. Negative side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janice. Now it's time for the judges to look over their notes, to fill in their ballots completely, and to sign their ballots, and to sign it for the government or for the opposition, please. the ballots. Oh, could you sit together in the middle so we could get you on camera, please? Thank you. Yeah, that's perfect. A little closer, a little closer. Then defection, yeah. Do I have all the ballots? So everyone voted. On the question of whether the United States should unilaterally reduce carbon emission, the vote was 12 to 6 
in favor of the government. We should unilaterally <coughs> reduce carbon emissions. Let's start with Warren. Hi, everyone. I work for the opposition because... Start everybody. with your name. I'm Warren. Hi, Warren. I work for the opposition because I really like her rebuttal. Like she counted almost all, all the points. points. <laughs> My plan... <laughs> it's like, I like her metaphor. It's like, hopefully... That was good. Probably a good metaphor. I really like that. And that's why I work for the opposition. Okay, thank you, Warren. <laughs> yes, please. Um, I have a run. I Hi, also Ron. vote for the opposition because you know, he's not wearing a tie. I thought you guys both did a really good job. Um, uh, I thought, like, when uh, you started uh, doing your cross with him, like, you really lawyered him. Like, right there at the beginning, you were, the way you were asking the questions and the sequence in which you were doing it was really excellent. Um, I thought, uh, let me see what else I got here. I thought also when, um, you gave her the recycle analogy, and then you kind of like took him into another direction <laughs> so he couldn't get his point across. Mm -hmm. That was fun too. Oh, but, uh, but you guys are both great. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lauren. I voted Hi, Lauren. Um, for the government uh, on personal beliefs, but I actually didn't know who to vote for for a while until so the uh, ratification came in, rebuttal. Um, mm -hmm. You both did really well on your cross examinations. I was really impressed with how you both, like, how you attacked each other and then how you defended yourself. It was, I really liked it. It was overall a really um, great debate. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack. Um, Hi, Jack. Like her, throughout most of the debate, I didn't know which side to choose. So I was thinking about going with, with the opposition until the rebuttal when she said that, that America's already, uh, the U.S. is already, you know, having uh, hybrid cars and this and that. And I think that those were um, ways to reduce carbon emissions. So uh, I think that the United States is already taking that step to reduce it. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Farhan. Hi, Farhan. I voted for the proposition because I thought, um, or just during uh, like cross examination, like you had more stronger points, um, and that got across. Um, I kind of wish you uh, asked for Janice, like you asked more like questions that weren't related to, like I felt like you asked questions that were just like, oh, you know, do you know how many percent of this or how many percent of that. Um, but overall, I really like how you presented um, your case. I thought you guys did both really well. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, please. Uh, my name is Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Uh, I voted in favor of the proposition because initially, when you said the more is better, and then he said, well, I mean, any improvement will help, that kind of sold me. I mean, because I don't think it really matters if they do it or not, as long as we're helping. It's a progression, so as long as we help. Country by country, it will lead to a better site. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Hi, I'm Bradley. Hi, Bradley. Um, I also voted in favor of the proposition. I actually didn't vote in favor of the proposition for anything he said. I voted for him. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I voted for him because of the way he he um, controlled the like the debate in terms of like structuring it so that like like. Everything was brought back to his his brief, and it was like very mm -hmm. specific about what he was talking about versus like versus what versus um, like the ability to like kind of push points past what exactly was said. So. He's always on his ground. Good, thank you. Hi, my name is Keaton. Um, Hi, Keaton. Uh, I voted for the proposition because I like the way every time she tried to bring up China. Like what they're doing, you just kind of went back to the issue at hand, which was that we didn't need anybody else to do what we were doing. I thought mm -hmm. that I just like kept hammering that home, just made sense, and it really seemed like you had a defense to that. But you had really good points on your side, just like your brief. Like, I actually really like that too, just your ideas and stuff really good, but I just like that other part a little bit more. Okay. Hi, I'm Christy, and Hi, I voted Christy. for the government, but I thought you both did a really good job, and I like, agreed with a lot of your points. I just thought it was a tough standpoint for you to have, because no matter what, it's like we're going to agree, like, we should do something, like, despite what everyone else is doing. 
And so I just thought you could. And then, yeah, the way you presented it, I agree with Bradley. Just you are commanding. And actually, I liked your cross-examination, but I didn't feel like it did anything for your point, really. You kept asking questions, but I didn't think it like really attacked him or did anything to like substantiate your side. Uh, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Brian. i got to agree with that, though. She does have a really hard position to defend. Yeah. That's, that's a rough one. Yeah. Well, there are ways to do it, but she didn't do it. <laughs> what is your name? Thing. Hi, Thing. I go for the opposition because I read her on the um, let people work in at home. I I don't think that all people like can work in like, at home. Maybe it's to affect the economy, and I think you need to do more research on that. Yeah, that seemed like a pie in the sky, didn't it? There's, there wasn't a lot of solvency for that, was there? Yes, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Fat. Hi, Fat. I think this is the last chance I can talk now, so I'm going to talk. <laughs> so, well, I supported the idea of the proposition from the beginning to the end, but I voted for opposition because of the effort that, because opposition is very hard position, in my opinion. When I read that, I didn't know how I would approach the end of opposition. And, um... I like I care a lot about like the numbers you throw out, even though they're confusing. But this is one point that you, throw out. you you mentioned. Yeah, I think that, that when you compare like the the weight of the elephants in Africa, is it, that they're not really needed oh, here. Yeah. In my but, but like was, this was like two in the morning, so I was tired to sell. Them. Yeah, and then you mentioned that you said that when we reduce by fifteen percent or twenty percent, but then you brought up like a number, not a percent, that we can reduce in emission. So they're not very, re like, I don't see the picture there. I mean, I want to see how many percent we, we reduce if we reduce the 15% emission like that. that I mean, like, you give a number. There's a fight. Can I address that real quick? There's real now, quick. Uh, everybody read the book, right? Like, freaking all the, the, all those, the ways you can kind of massage numbers. Yeah. If I would have given you percents, nobody would have voted for me. That's really? what's hilarious, no, yeah. No. Um, the numbers sound really, really bad. You know, millions and billions of tons and all kind of stuff. I'm talking about like 0.8% or 1% mm. or something. Well, that's just like that. something, right? I just want that. Yeah. yeah. The more the better. I, mean, I don't want to give you the percents. Okay. That would make me lose. And one thing, like, I think everyone noticed that you guys kind of don't agree on the definition much, like the motion of the debate. Like, um, like when, you, when the opposition asks you a question in the cross-examination, like, why do we do that like, without the help and you, you, you re-clarify that, no, we do it, it doesn't matter if they do or not. But then in your rebuttal, you said that, um, okay, remember, you said that it doesn't mean we do, China uh, cannot do it, remember you said that? But that's not what she said, she meant. Yeah. I think she meant that um, we shouldn't do unless they cooperate with us. Yeah, that's yeah. a different thing, but mm -hmm. you said something different. You said it doesn't mean what we do, China cannot do it. You know what I, mean? I, I get what you said. Yeah, they're different. It just that. Uh, so. My point is, we don't have to lock ourselves in China. We do it regardless. Yeah. So I think I voted because of the effort. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Fat. <laughs> yes, please. Talk a lot. Hi, I'm Tony. Um, Hi, Tony. I voted for the um, proposition. Uh, I agree that, um, like, my classmate says, like, the Janice has the really hard um, standpoint. Um, but I really like what you did in that cross examination when you asked me about the recycling and your last lecture. Because <laughs> <laughs> the, the price is not much, right? Uh, I really like that one. And um, like, I feel like whatever Janice uh, was trying to say, Ian can drag, drag, uh, drag it back to the um, point that saying that um, even others are not doing, we still have to do our part to make the world better. So um, I voted for the government. Okay, fair enough. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Kihan. Hi, yeah, Kihan. I, I work for the proposition of the government. Yes, then is Tony. I like the government used to recycle to be an example. Like, no matter your neighborhood recycle or not, you still recycle. And for the opposition, Janice, I, I, I know you do a better research than Ian, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Probably so, yeah. Yeah, but, but, uh, but you're talking too much about why China should reduce the carbon, but you didn't mention a lot about why U.S. shouldn't. Like, you mentioned U.S. can afford it, but you didn't go over it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, please. I voted. Name? Am I Ian Holocaust? Hi, Angelica. 
Uh, I vote for Ian because he's like really persuasive. Um, he can probably solve ice cubes to Eskimos. But he has this like really crazy Ian mode where it's like he's just so intimidating, and scary, it's like frightening. Like I'd rather get a root canal than like ever argue against Ian. No offense. <laughs> like bless your heart with your scary as shit. Please become a lawyer. <laughs> Huh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Okay, um, hi, I'm Melissa, and so I'm here like, um, Ian as well, and so I think it's honestly just because of like how hard this position was, because Janice, I really preferred um, your like, argument and what you did with it. I thought your cross-examination and um, reputations were really good. And also, um, Ian, I thought you were really harsh during the cross-examination. Um, like when you were cross-examining her, I think you like went a little bit overboard in like um, how you're like communicating your like opinion on it. Um, even though it was like good, I just like it kind of like turned me against you a little bit. Um, as a person, Heard. Heard. <laughs> good arguments, but as a dick. Heard his credibility a little. That will, that can happen. Yes, Hi, I'm John. Hi, John. And I, uh, I voted in favor of the proposition, and the reason that kind of ended up happening for me was because they did have a difference in opinions on what they kind of, on the definitions that they were proposing. Um, I think where the opposition kind of fell short is that pro the proposition was that we should unilaterally do it regardless, and she was saying, oh, well, we should wait for so-and-so. And then the proposition immediately turned around by saying, we don't have to wait, we can just go, and if they're going to follow suit, they're going to follow suit eventually. Like, we, just, we, we need to do this now because it's bad. And I think... Yeah. Regardless of what our percentage was compared to China's or compared to mm -hmm. India's, which nobody even addressed, uh, we still take up 15% of the emission rates, and if that's the case, then regardless of what anybody else is doing, we should start it, and if they're going to fall suit, they're going to fall suit, but yeah. it doesn't really benefit us to kind of wait longer to see if they join us, but it should be dealt with now. So I think overall that kind of swayed the proposition. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Hello, everyone. I'm Jacqueline. Hi, Jacqueline. Um, I voted for the opposition. I voted for Janice because I do think that if we're all in this together, so we don't, if nobody's going to put pressure, if the free world is not going to put pressure on China or India, then what's going to happen? Um, even though I did agree with a lot of your points, and I did like how you put the numbers in perspective, but at the same time, it kind of later on helped me decide for Janice, because then I thought, okay, well, how many elephants is China? I mean, this type of thing. Um, so I think you guys did like, really interesting uh, cross examinations, and you maybe could have spent less time talking about working at home or the office. Yeah. And the last but not least. Hi, my name is Yusuf. Hi, Yusuf. I voted for Janice, um, and I'll kind of say my, my reasons in two parts. So first, the presentation. Um, Ian, I think you were reading too much. You, you were reading far too much from the paper, not looking at it enough, so you lost it right away. Uh, but really, where you lost the argument was in the content. Um, so the way you looked at this problem was, was I think it was childish and irresponsible. <laughs> you looked at it like one step down the line, and you didn't think about it strategically, right? It was, it was premature. Um, and, then, and then you kept saying, oh, it will cost us money, but you never monetize that. So you looked at the benefits, but never monetize the cost. And that's always a bad idea, because then I can't make a good decision, because you're not going to have the tools to make that decision. Um, then you said, like, quantifiable data is not available. Yep. Like, never say that, right? If it's not available, don't say it. Because now you're, now, now you're losing, you losing obviously credibility. Don't debate, then. You say that often. You're losing credibility, and then I think Janice did a really good job of taking advantage of that. Um, I also thought there was a lot of fluff in your speech. Like you, you kept talking about the same thing over and over again, and there wasn't really any numbers for that. I think Janice, you won on that part. Um, one area of, uh, I would have liked to see both of you talk about more a little bit, but especially you, Ian, because you were on that side, was the competitive disadvantages, is that Right, yeah, if we reduce carbon emissions, how is that going to affect the chances of China reducing their carbon emissions? Do we hold a position of, of power over them because we haven't done it yet, right? It's a, it's a game theory, and I think um, Janice, you kind of touched on that, and Ian, you didn't do that at all. Um, for those reasons, I think Janice won the argument. Okay, thank you. Let's give him another round of applause. And let's give a big boo to the uh, two that didn't show up. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you uh, collect the uh, two things and that are owed to me and put them in this, these two folders, please, from everyone? And uh, I will set up the last uh, uh, thing we're going to do today. I didn't.
Sad questions like that all the time. Yeah, <laughs> Someone tries to use percent, you know, like percentages. Slow down. Because I know that. 
Oh, fuck no, I'm not going to tell that. Yeah. That's the bait. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, realistically, if I was, if I really had to win this game, I, would, I wouldn't have done freaking, you know, stop people from going to work and do, like, you know, that kind of thing. That's a stupid plan. I, I should have done, like, renewable energy or something. Yeah. Basically, have not only innocent uh, children, but innocent children. Uh, you have Venmo? Uh, what? Venmo? What is that, like an app? It's like hot to
there have been maybe innocent civilians who have been killed that have possibly led to some suicide bombers. But we argue that as we continue to evolve our policy, that's going to be less and less likely to happen. And also, even if we have some terrorism here, not all terrorism is, called by, terrorism is caused by drone strikes, and drone strikes are an important part of actually defending American interests. Um, against terrorism, um, and this brings me kind of to my th this brings me to my third point uh, of evolving threats. Um, if we look at people or groups like ISIS or groups like Al Qaeda, sometimes you have to act quickly. Like if you look, even um, obviously Osama bin Laden was not taken out by a drone strike, but that was a very covert, uh, very quick mission. Um, that is increasingly what American military operations seem to be uh, heading towards. And we're, all we're saying is that instead of even sending in maybe a SEAL team and endangering those lives, we can actually put a drone strike in, that situ in some situations um, and, and have a successful outcome for the United, for United States interests. That's a benefit that you see on, uh, on the opposition side. Um, in these remote areas, it's often difficult to actually send troops anyway. So um, because we're, we're going to be sending more Americans into a dangerous area, why shouldn't we use the technology that we have at hand to approach these issues? It doesn't. It just simply doesn't make sense. The United States would say, no, we should use technology that has been proven to be, yes, it is effective. The government is not arguing it's not effective. Just say that there has been some harm. It is effective. Um, it has been able to uh, successfully prevent more Americans from being involved in some of these conflicts. Um, and that is a, that's a benefit. Um, additionally, citizens from around the world are joining movements like ISIS. They are actually flying. People from America are leaving. People from Europe, France, Germany have already lost like thousands of their own civilians to these causes. Sometimes you need to act quickly, possibly, to prevent them from coming back into your country and suicide bombing your like, citizens that are still at home. That's a problem that we think could be um, uh, solved through using drone strikes. And additionally, when we look at economic and economic economic costs as well, we see that drone strikes are, are going to be more effective, um, not only just by saving lives, but also by uh, saving costs. So it's really for all these reasons that any flaws that are already happening can be solved by changing policy because we have an obligation to protect our citizens and our interests abroad, um, and we can do this by using drone strikes, and because there are evolving threats that demand a different approach, and we believe drone strikes do fulfill this, I strongly oppose this resolution. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm going to start by reading two points made by um, opposition, some points that they brought up. The first point that was first brought up at a POI was that what is the definition of more drone strikes than we should? Well, as my partner already answered, we believe more drone strikes than we should is that when we start to kill innocent people and more innocent people by far than we are actually targeting, that is when we are crossing the line way over the line of how many drone strikes we should be using. A second point is that you said that there is a process involved in finding these targets. Yeah, the process is that they have a vague link to a terrorist organization and they send strikes out into gatherings where these people are present. That's not an effective process. Again, you, you argued about the implementation of drones and that you want to um, develop implementation of drones. Drones are not specific sniper shots. They are basically small bombs. How are you planning to kill one person with a drone? You're going to have to wait until